Good evening, everyone. Great to see everyone here here this evening at this president's uh, lecture. I'm Jim Schmader, president of Western, and uh, it's great to have you here in the Ives Concert Hall uh, this evening. In this series uh, of lectures over the years, we've we've heard from diplomats and business leaders and uh, and artists and film directors and astronauts and all different kinds of people. But I, I, I would say that I can't imagine a speaker having a more eventful past year or so than our speaker tonight, Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA. You know, Mr. Uh, Dr. Emmert was supposed to be here in February, and uh, he, we were snowed out that night. It was the second snowstorm of that week that got us. And uh, so we rescheduled. But in those eight months or so since... Dr. Emmer was supposed to be here. A lot has happened on the intercollegiate athletics front and to the NCAA. We've we've seen the uh, the so-called O'Bannon case about student athlete uh, representation. We've uh, we've seen student athletes from my alma mater, Northwestern University, uh, vote to uh, to have a vote for unionization. Uh, we've seen the reorganization of the p five power conferences. A lot has happened. And Dr. Emmert, I know, will be speaking about those events tonight. But he'll also, I'm sure, be speaking about the values and the philosophy and the beliefs that he has about intercollegiate athletics, uh, beliefs that really go back uh, and are consistent with the founding of, of the NCAA and what it meant, and very consistent with uh, what we do here at Western uh, in Division Three. Athletics. I saw those values and beliefs uh, very evident on, a, on an ongoing basis in the time I worked with Dr. Emmert in my role as on the uh, Division Three President's Council and an Executive Council. So it's great that he can be here with us tonight. Mark Emmert is a graduate at the undergraduate level of the University of Washington. He received his PhD in public policy from Syracuse University. Uh, he, ha he has had administrative assignments at Montana State University, the University of Colorado, and from 1995 through 1999, he served as chief operating and academic officer of the University of Connecticut, so he knows the territory here. He went from UConn to be chancellor of Louisiana State University and then returned to his undergraduate alma mater, the University of Washington, to serve as president there until 2010 when he became the fifth president of the NCAA. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mark Emmert. Well, thank you, Jim. Is, is this mic working? Yes, I'm, I'm a pacer, so um, if you don't mind, I'll pace. So, uh, first of all, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, it's great to be back in Connecticut, and it's terrific to be at, uh, at Western. I had a chance earlier today to sit down with a number of student athletes. I see some are out here uh, and talk about what was going on in intercollegiate athletics with them. And it's always a pleasure to get to, to uh, talk to uh, audiences with lots of attitudes and views about intercollegiate athletics. And what I hope to do tonight is to talk for just a little bit about some of the issues that the president mentioned and then, and then uh, open it up for questions if anybody in the audience has any questions and we can talk about some of those things because it is a really, really interesting moment in the history of intercollegiate athletics. Uh, the NCAA is about 100 years old, 110 years old. College sports is a little old, about 50 years older than that. And, and if you look at the historical junction points for college sports, this is probably one of them right now that we're in the middle of. And it's, it's um, uh, fascinating where it's going to go. And we get a chance to live it and work through it and, and see what we can do to maintain this wonderful American tradition. So, so let me go back and begin sort of at the beginning. So intercollegiate athletics in America didn't really get started till around the time of the American Civil War. So if you, if you look at the history of college sports, the first intercollegiate athletic event was a rowing contest, actually, up on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire between Harvard and Yale, and I, I think it was 1858 or 59, somewhere in there, but before the Civil War. 
and and there'd been there'd been intramural sports on college campuses, but nobody had ever decided that they ought to have contests but between schools themselves. They started, uh, it was a very successful event, and they decided to keep doing it, so you saw rowing get started, the uh, beginnings of baseball gets going, um, then everything gets interrupted by the horrible events of the Civil War, post-Civil War, people go back to college. I always used to joke that, uh, that there was a school in the South that got started in 1859, 1860 called Louisiana State University. It actually was a college back then, not a university, and the first president of, uh, of LSU that I wound up replacing uh, many, many years, decades later, was William Tecumseh Sherman, if you can imagine that. General Sherman's the first president. Now, this is in the Deep South, right? Civil War breaks. He gets through one class of students. The Civil War breaks out. All of his students joined the Confederacy, and he went back to Ohio and joined the Union and burned down Atlanta. Um, so, so you know, everybody finishes up at the end of at the end of the Civil War. They go back to their respective schools and they start all over again. But they still had had begun this nascent movement of intercollegiate athletics. They start playing interesting games. 1869, a group of guys get together and they play a game where they they had this odd shaped ball. Uh, they kicked it, they threw it, and they carried it and they didn't know what, quite what to call it, but that game in 1869 is now claimed as the first football game in America. It's interestingly also claimed as the first soccer game in America, and it's also claimed as the first rugby match in America because the game was indistinguishable among those three sports because there were basically no rules, except that it was really popular. The students loved it. And they all started playing these sports against each other, especially right here in the in the Northeast. The Northeast was the 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 home of not just American higher education, but not surprisingly, American sports, collegiate sports. So it's exploding. It takes off. You go forward just 20 years, 20, 30 years, a very short period of time, and all of a sudden, the largest public gatherings in America on a regular basis were college sporting events. It's a little hard to imagine right now that the Harvard-Yale game would attract 80 and 90,000 people in 1880, 1890, and, and 1900, but that's what it would do. You were getting for rowing events, college rowing events, would, especially right down the road in Poughkeepsie. It would, it would attract uh, hundreds of thousands, 100,000 people would line the banks of the river to watch college rowing events. There were some sort of professional events going on, but... Basically, for America, sports meant college sports. It was becoming very um, uh, popular, but it had a number of fundamental problems, one of which was there were no rules. So you had really fascinating things going on where schools would show up to the other school and they wanted to play football, for example, and they would sit down and they would decide what the local rules were and they'd figure out how they were going to play and then they'd, they'd go out and they'd play this game. Uh, that was sort of okay, but as it grew in popularity, you had some very interesting things. Like one of my favorite stories is university presidents quickly figured out, as university presidents do, that this was a pretty good way to, to build the image of a university because people were paying so much attention to it. So a little backwards school out in the West called the University of Oregon decided to send its football team to the Northeast to establish the brand of the University of Oregon. I doubt that they were called the Ducks then, but whatever they were, they came back to the Northeast. They lined up three games. They go up to an unnamed, uh, now Ivy League school in the middle of upstate New York to play a football game. And they, they get there, and they line up to play this game, and they realize the average age on the other team is somewhere around 35. And they quickly figure out, gee, I don't think all these guys look like college students. And uh, lo and behold, they weren't. They were guys that the alumni had hired to beat up the kids from Oregon, which they proceeded to do. And that would be bad enough, except when they went to the second game, there was the same team that beat them up again. And then when they went to the third game, there was the same team which beat them up again. And, and the fact was there were no rules about who should play, how the game was going to get played, or whether or not you had to be even a student. Now... All of that would be sort of funny, except it also led to, in the case of football, uh, an absolutely, utterly brutal game. 1904, 19 boys were killed playing the game of football in the United States. 
there were probably, there's probably today literally a hundred times more young men playing football today than then, but let's just imagine there's only 10 times as many. That would be the functional equivalent of 190 young men dying this year playing the game of football. You, you can imagine how the country would react if that was what was going on. Uh, and the country reacted pretty much that way. You had here in the Northeast, in the Midwest, all around the country, a huge hue and cry to end college sports. And the arguments for ending college sports went something like this. It was too physically uh, damaging to young men in particular. There were no young women playing sports now, of course, at this, at this time. But it was too physically damaging. Too many kids were getting hurt, first and foremost. Secondly, they were arguing that it was far too commercial. People were just doing this to make money. There was, they were charging for admission. There was no TV audiences, but they were charging for admission. They were raising money for, for sports, and it, it was just all about commercial, commercialism. By the way, the first college athletic event, the rowing, that rowing contest up on Lake Winnipesaukee, why was it in New Hampshire when those schools are not in New Hampshire? Because the game was put together by a guy who owned a railroad that ran to his lodge on Lake Winnipesaukee, and he was trying to figure out how to drum up business so he sold tickets to people to go watch a college event so that he could fill his hotel. The very first game, college sporting game, was a very much a commercial enterprise. So it's far too commercial. It's all about the money. Third, it's a complete distraction for all of the students who should be studying. Why in the world are they involved in sports when they're only here to study? And fourth, it has nothing to do with college education and why in the world should we be participating in an entertainment sport. When you go back and read the headlines and the editorials out of the New York Times and all the major newspapers of the day, when you listen to speeches by university leaders and presidents, it's almost like they are exactly written today. They are, except the English is better. Other than that, I mean, it sounds, see, that usually gets a laugh. It was kind of, it was a pretty good joke. You know, the fact of the matter is, is the arguments about what was going on in college sports then looked a lot like the arguments about what's going on in college sports today, except for this huge negative impact on the young men playing the games. Death and disabling injuries were rampant. It was, it was really awful. And there was no way to have a championship in any sport because the rules were made up as people made them up. And, and there was no way to oversee and manage all of these sports collectively. Teddy Roosevelt gets involved, big sports fan, Harvard guy, loved Harvard football. He gets involved. Congress get, uh, sort of gets involved by, by being engaged in the conversation. And a group of university presidents, mostly from the Northeast and some from the Midwest, all come together and they form the NCAA. And they decided that what they wanted to do was govern the games themselves, that they wanted the universities and the colleges themselves to be the ones to say, here's what the rules are, here's how we're going to apply the rules, here's how we're going to hold each other accountable, here's how we're going to make this all work. Now, that was 110 years ago. You fast forward to today, and you move from the 60 or so schools that started the NCAA and started college sports in America, and I don't know how many young men were playing the games then, let's say a couple hundred at each school. So I don't know what that adds up to, 1,200 or so young men playing college sports in America. And, and what, do you have? <clears throat> what do you have now? You have 1,100 colleges and universities in the NCAA, not counting the NAIA or, or the community college system of college sports, but just in the NCAA, 1,100 colleges and universities you have over 19,000 teams inside the NCAA playing college sports, and you have close to a half a million, it's about 465,000 right now, 465,000 individual students playing NCAA sports in all three divisions across all of America. And the other fascinating thing is we're the only country that ever did that. If you go to Europe, Latin America, Asia, and you talk about the fact that, uh, that there is a college team here at Western, and you talk to another university over there, they'll, they'll not have a clue what you're talking about. There, are, there aren't college teams in other countries. Not, you know, Canada sort of does it a little bit. Mexico does it a tiny bit. 
But in North America, it's all American. And if you go to Europe, they, they do it very, very little. They kind of have soccer teams, clubs that they run out of their schools. In Australia, they kind of have soccer clubs. They don't have a formal league and nothing like the NCA. And Asia doesn't know what you're talking about, Latin America either. So for the most part, this is a very uniquely American experience. It's become this iconic part of American culture. The leading college events now rival all of the, the sporting events in America in terms of their popularity and the way they grip the country. Uh, the, the NCAA men's basketball tournament just about drops the GDP of the country 10% during, the week, during those three weeks because everybody's glued to their TV. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that everybody in America pays attention to, and it's become such an integral fabric of what it is to be an American college or university that practically everybody participates in it because it kind of defines the college experience now in America. But at the same time, we've got all of these criticisms from similar to the criticisms from way back when. They're, they're continued, they've been morphed and changed, and they're very different kinds of arguments today. But a lot of them are still out there. So there's today a lot of concern about the health and well-being of student athletes. We don't have 19 young men dying playing football this year, obviously, and we're very, very pleased that we don't see anywhere near the rate of injury. And football, as a sport, has gotten progressively safer almost every year, but we still are all, I'm certainly, and I know everybody here, is deeply concerned about concussion events. We're still worried about young men getting hurt playing, playing the game of football in all kinds of ways. And what we're discovering also now is concussions and other injuries don't just affect football, they affect soccer, they affect lacrosse, they affect just about every sport that's out there, and they're cause for concern. So the NCAA still today is very, very focused on how do we take care of the health and well-being of student athletes, and there's a lot of things more that we need to do, and we can talk about that in a minute. We still know that there's great concern about the the conflict or potential rub between sports and academic success. Division three schools like Western have a great balance between the two. They don't have anywhere near the conflicts that you see at a Division one program, and, and that's a very good thing. I'm a big fan of the Division three model, and I'm delighted to be here uh, talking to Division three athletes in this campus. But the reality also is that while things have started to progress uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, by the time we got to the end of the 20th century, and since then to now in 2014, we've seen remarkable changes in the academic success of student athletes. The fact of the matter is people don't fully uh, understand because it's, it's perfectly explicable why they don't get it, but at virtually every campus in America, at virtually every college and university in America, if you're an NCA student athlete, your graduation rate is higher than the rest of the campus. Student athletes have better academic success across the board in virtually every place you look than the non-athletes on that campus. And that's true whether they're men or women, and it's true regardless of, of racial characteristics. In fact, when you look at the academic success in Division I of African American males, African-American males at a Division I university that happen to be an athlete have a 12% higher graduation, point, graduation rate than the non-athlete non African-American males on those campuses. Almost in every case, student athletes outperform academically their counterparts. Now, there's issues there that we've got to work on, and football and men's basketball still aren't performing as well as we'd like. But we had a lot of changes in, in uh, a number of other sports that have had really significant success of late, and we're really pleased about that. We've made new strides again recently to, to move that along. We know that today there's an enormous amount of concern also about the, the, the whole economic issues around college sports. College sports for a variety of reasons, sports in general for a variety of reasons around the nature of media today, and the fact that you, you can view almost any TV show or any multimedia show uh, in, when you want to rather than in a linear fashion. You don't have to just watch a TV show at its appointed hour. You watch it when you want to because of all the ways you can consume media today. But the one thing you have to watch at the time that it's going on is a sporting event. It drives a lot of 
attention to that particular moment in time. And that's driven up the values of sports in media markets. And so now you see in Division I football and basketball, you've seen these really, really large media contracts. And it's drove, driven a lot of top-line revenue into college sports. And that has, again, created a lot of concern that I and others share about, well, what does that all mean? And what's that all doing? And where's all that money going? The, the, the common assumption is, is that universities and colleges are making billions, if not millions, mi millions, if not billions of dollars, and that's what college sports are all about. Well, here's an interesting phenomenon. College sports in America, remember, include 1,100 schools, 1,100 colleges and universities. Last year, the data is actually from the year before last, so we don't have current data because you have to look at tax returns and other data to get this. But the most recent data, 18-month-old data, there were 22 universities, 22 universities out of 1,100 that had positive cash flow in their athletic department last year. 22, which is to say virtually no university or college has positive cash flow, makes a profit off the college sports program. Indeed, the opposite is exactly the case. The great vast majority, 90, whatever those ratios are, 99%, 99.5% of colleges and universities put money into their sports program to support their pro sports program because of the opportunities it provides students, the opportunities to build collegiality on the campus and community, the opportunity to have some social glue that keeps your alumni and everybody else engaged with the campus, and because, as I said, it's become part of what we all think is now almost a definition of American higher education. It is the case that football at Division I generates for about three quarters, not all, about three quarters of the football teams in Division I generate more revenue than they produce. In other words, they turn a profit. Well, what happens to all that money? Well, every university that has a football program uses any revenue above their expenses for football to pay for everything else. So it's how you pay for lacrosse and softball and soccer and gymnastics and swimming and every other sport that goes on on those campuses is supported by the revenue that comes from football if they're lucky enough to have positive cash flow from their football team, those three quarters of those schools in Division I. All of that res those resources are used to pay for everything else that goes on around the sports program because none of the others have positive cash flow about half of the Division I men's basketball programs have positive cash flow. And that in turn, and that would be, so UConn, for example, has positive cash flow. I haven't looked at their data, but I'm confident of what I'm saying. Has positive cash flow on men's basketball and loses money on football. And they're probably the only program in America that has positive cash flow for women's basketball. Um, Tennessee used to, but I don't know that they do today. But but UConn would, they'd be the only one women's basketball program in America that generates more revenue than it consumes. So all of those resources are paying for all of those programs. At the NCAA, the concern about the top line revenue is the same thing. So if you, let me explain that the NCAA generates the organization itself, not all the schools. The NCAA itself generates revenue from the men's basketball tournament. We can only um, uh, generate revenue, sell the media rights and the productions to our tournaments. So we have nothing to do with the production of regular season games or the bowl games or anything around Division 1A football. We generate all of the revenue that we get from the Division 1 men's basketball tournament and a couple of other ancillary things. But 90% of the revenue comes from that one event. And well, what do we do with that one event, with those revenues? Well, first, right off the top, 8% of it is taken off the top, and it's given to Division II and Division III. It's what pays for all of the championships for Divisions II and Division III, supports most of the, a lot of the conference offices, and provides all of those opportunities for those two divisions. Out of that, it's the, the grand total of this, by the way, is about $800 million, which is a lot of money. But that $800 million is first 8% goes to Divisions II and III, $400 million of the balance is sent right back to the Division I schools. All the Division I schools get a piece of that. It's passed out in a complicated formula, but it all goes back right to those schools through their conference offices. 
Another $100 million comes off the top of it, and it goes to um, a student opportunity fund to support students on those campuses. So if the students have special needs in those Division I schools, they get access to those resources. And then it also pays for all of the operations of all of the tournaments, all 89 tournaments. We now run 89 national championships. It covers all of the costs of those 89 championships. It covers all of the costs for enforcement across all three divisions. It covers all of the costs for the governance of those, of those schools when the presidents and the ADs and everyone come together to make the rules and make decisions that covers those expenses. So it supports the entire infrastructure for almost a half a million student athletes off of one event, the men's basketball tournament. So there is still this concern that's been with us for 100 years that it's all about money. Money's gotten bigger. The resources have gotten bigger. But the, still the reality is that universities, with a handful of exceptions, like 22 exceptions, aren't generating positive cash flow. No university, including this one, plays college sports because you're making so much money at it. It's, it, it's a popular mythology out there, like the mythology that student athletes aren't good students when they're great students. And the fact is universities are not making lots of money off this. Yes, there is a slice of the coaching world that makes a lot of money in coaching. And everybody gets that. But that's the exception, not the rule by a long shot. So then you go into this whole notion of whether or not student athletics, college sports, ought to even be part of American higher education. Because it's not anywhere else in the world. And 100 years ago, before the NCA, that was a very popular debate. And we saw some schools get out of college sports back then. But more often than not, we see schools getting into the NCA and, and wanting to be part of college sports and wanting to have that as part of their, of their nature as a, as a collegiate activity. And it has historically begged the question, why in the world do universities even do this? Why don't we just stop playing college sports? And there's an interesting phenomenon now that's going on in the public debate and in the legal arena where a lot of lawsuits and a lot of people are, are arguing and contending that student athletes need to be paid employees. Indeed, there's some argument that they need to be unionized paid employees of individual schools. And the vast majority of university presidents that I talk to say, well, that would be very interesting, but I can't fantasize why we would want to do that. And if that's the case, then we will just stop playing college sports. Why would we want to, you know, the, their argument goes, why would we want to hire someone to win a football game for me? And if I was going to hire them to win a football game for me, why would I ever want them to be a student? Calculus gets in the way. If, you're, if they're an employee and you're paying them to win a football game, why would you want them to be a student also? You don't do that with the rest of your employees. Come to think of it, they argue, why would you want them to be 18? If I'm going to hire a football team, why didn't I hire them out of the Canadian Football League? Why would I send them away after four years? If they're a pretty good quarterback, why wouldn't I keep paying them? Why wouldn't I hire the guys that got too tired for the NFL, but they could still play college ball? If I'm hiring employees, and this has nothing to do with being a student, and it's not about the best college students playing sports. It's just about hiring the best team that I can hire. Why would I do that? Why does that make any sense? And it also begs the interesting question, who would want to watch that? So we survey, we in the NCAA survey our fan base and the citizenry all the time. And it's really interesting because people that watch college sports don't watch it because they think they're watching the absolute best athletes. They know that NBA teams can beat the best college team. They know that NFL teams can beat the best football team. They know that Major League Baseball can beat the best college baseball team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they watch it because they like to watch college students play ball. They like to watch university students that are competing as part of their experience as being on that campus. They know full well that when they turn on the TV on Saturday that their team or the team that they cheer for might have two or three, at the best, two or three young men on that football team that are going to play professionally. They, when they watch 
um, a, a women's basketball game, they know there may be one or two women on that team that will play professionally, but that's it. They know the rest are there because they love to play the game, because they're athletes at heart, and because they're playing for their school and they're getting an education. That's what the fan base tells us all the time. And so if you separate those two things and you say, yeah, you know, this really isn't about academics and athletics. It's about athletics. It has nothing to do with academics. And you move to a professionalized model where you just say, look, this is just NFL light, or this is NBA light, or this is Major League Baseball light, or WNBA light. Most university leaders say, don't want to participate, don't want to watch it. So for, for the NCAA membership, those 1,100 schools, keeping those two things linked as tightly as possible is what the whole enterprise is all about. Even though this has been a 100-year running debate, everybody comes back to the same issue and says, this is about putting young men and young women on a court, on a floor, giving them an opportunity to succeed as highly as they can, at the highest level they can in sports and in the classroom and helping them go launch their lives. And that's, by the way, what happens in the vast, vast majority of cases in college sports. When people make their conclusion about college sports and what they think college sports is about by watching TV, here's what they see, right? So you you turn on the TV Saturday and you're going to watch mostly the top 50 or so football teams in America, maybe the top 65 or so football teams in America on TV this weekend. When we get around to our tournament, we'll have the top 68 teams representing a bunch of conferences across the country in our tournament for men's basketball. Those are the two things that are on TV ubiquitously. When you're looking at that, when you're watching those sets of events, which is what the majority of Americans see, they think they're watching college athletics. They are watching 3% of intercollegiate athletics, 3%. They are missing 97%, including everything that goes on here. They're missing 97% of intercollegiate athletics. But their conclusion is, well, I know what college sports is because I, I, I watched it last Saturday night. I watched 100,000 people sitting at a bowl game, in, a, in a big bowl, and, and they were all paying a lot of money, and, and everybody was making a lot of money, and they were selling TV ads. And, and so clearly college sports is this incredibly incredibly lucrative business and I watched the you know this team or that team in the men's final four and they had three one and dones and so nobody wants to go to college they just want to go and play for one year and then get to the NBA as fast as they can and and indeed there are about 12 young men a year that do that out of the 15,000 who play to play NCAA basketball about 12 are one and dones about 60 get drafted into the NBA, depending upon how good Europe is in any one year. About 60 go to the NBA out of 15,000. We write the rules, the members write the rules, the universities write the rules themselves around the 15,000 men's basketball players and the 15,000 women's basketball players, not around the 60 who get drafted to go play professional sport. The whole notion is about allowing young men and women to have an opportunity to pursue their ambitions and their aspirations at, in a way that's as successful as they possibly can. Now, do we have some things that we need to do? Yeah, we have a lot of things we need to do. I'm deeply concerned about the health and welfare issues, and we've got to be much more aggressive about the whole issue of concussions, for example. Uh, but changing rules in the NCA is an interesting phenomenon because it's this very democratic body. Every school In Divisions 2 and Division 3 has a voice in every rule change. In Division 1, they have a representative body that looks a bit like Congress and sometimes functions a lot like Congress, which is to say, not at all. And so getting changes and getting consensus around what rules they want to have in place and how they want me and my staff to to, uh, implement those rules is an interesting challenge. But I do get to sit down with them and say, look, here's some things that need to happen. And one of them is we need to be much more aggressive about the protocols around concussions. We know what what we need to do, and we've got a lot of rules in place, but, you know, in my opinion, we need to have teeth behind that so that if somebody, uh, an adult in the room, not a player, but somebody on a bench or somebody on a sideline or somebody somewhere in the the medical staff doesn't follow all those protocols, they need to be held accountable. I I think it's odd that, you know, that a commissioner in a college conference will find the... uh, a coach for yelling at an official $25,000, but 
we don't see the same thing on the side of whether or not they implemented all the concussion regulations. A kid's brain is infinitely more important than, than an umpire getting yelled at, in my opinion. So we need to work on those things and be, be much better at it. We've got that work to do. There are a lot of things that we can do for student athletes, especially in Division I, and I know this is a Division III school, obviously, but in Division I where they're generating a lot of revenue and there are young men and women who have potential professional careers that half a percent or so, we need to make sure that we're providing them with the kind of insurance that should they incur an injury that has some impact on their, on their uh, future earnings as a professional athlete, that that's covered. And that's not, there's, there's no reason that there's not resources available to make those things work and provide that kind of support. We need to make sure that when we're doing, offering scholarships for scholarship athletes, that they have a clear opportunity to complete that scholarship, even if they leave to play professionally and then want to come back and finish. I think they ought to be allowed to do that. We need to make some of those changes in, the, in those arenas. We need to worry a lot right now about not just physical health. We've got to understand a lot more about physical health. We don't understand enough. Science doesn't understand enough about concussion. We've got to do a lot of research, and we're working hard on it. We've got a $30 million project going with the Department of Defense to understand the what's in science terms is just called the history of concussion, meaning how do you get one, what happens afterwards, what are the real facts, not just what are the, you know, the stories that we hear. We've got to get that done. We've got to understand how women, young women and girls are blowing knees too much. We've got way too many knee injuries in women athletes, and we're not sure why. We need to understand that better and figure out those kinds of issues. We've got a huge challenge around mental health issues in higher education in general, but among athletes in particular that we pay attention to. We, we know this is the case. We believe, but we don't have good data, that the stresses and strains of being a student, of being, uh, a, you know, just doing all the things you have to do in college and being an athlete is really, really hard. And for the vast majority of kids, that works out fine, but for a bunch, it doesn't. And they've got a lot of pressure a lot of concerns, and it's showing up in a lot of ways around mental health issues that young people are showing up with, and we need to figure that one out and help deal with it. we got to make sure that student athletes in Division Three as well as in, in Two and One have sufficient time to take advantage of all the things that a university education has to offer. Nobody should not have an opportunity to study abroad because of their sport. Nobody should not have an opportunity to participate in an internship uh, because of their sport. Nobody should not have uh, an opportunity to prepare for their career after college because they're participating in the sport. Yeah, it takes a lot of time and energy to be a successful athlete, and we need to, we need to recognize all of that. But at the same time, if this is about helping young men and women be successful after their college careers, we've got to keep our eye on that ball as well. There's a whole laundry list of things that we need to do inside the college sports world, and we're trying to work our way down that list, and we've restructured our decision-making system in Division I so that the presidents in Division I can get to those answers faster. We're trying to do a lot of things differently in the NCAA national office around the way we conduct our business, and, and that's slow to change, but we're making really good strides. I'm really pleased about it. But most importantly in all of that, we also have to make sure that while we're doing change, while we're responding to the, criti the legitimate criticisms out there, we don't throw away uh, an amazing American institution. There, there are right now, as we speak, as I said, 465,000 kids playing NCAA sports. The vast majority of them won't be on TV. All but a tiny fraction, maybe a half of a percent, won't play professional sports. Uh, but they'll have that great experience. If they're lucky and they work hard, they get to play in an NCAA tournament, and that's just like the best thing in the world for a student athlete. But then they're done, and then they go on, and then they become teachers and doctors and lawyers and everything else that we want them to become, and that's what the main goal is. We can't throw that away. We can't let concerns about a handful of things, especially a tiny, tiny fraction of what college sports is about, throw that all away because we're struggling to address those issues. So this is a great time to be involved in college sports. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, despite those challenges, I'm loving it. I get to work with a lot of great university presidents and athletic directors and coaches. Uh, I get to meet a lot of student athletes, and then that's the highlight of why I do this. And, uh, and I get to come to places like this and talk to you all. So 
Let me pause there and take any questions you have on anything in college sports. They have some microphones set up in the, in the corner. So if you have a question, I think that's what we want you to do is to use the mics. Okay? Thank you. I, yeah, you can just queue up behind the mics if you have a question. Hi, my name is Elliot Woolwich. I'm a graduate of uh, Central Connecticut State University uh -huh. uh, and the University of Hartford, and I attended uh, University of Connecticut, and I taught for 34 years. Well, one of my pet peeves and questions to you in regards to Division I basketball is that the rating system, when uh, the tournament comes about, is um, 16 plays number one. And what really concerns me is that uh, the statement is usually made that a 16 has never beaten a 1. Now, if you're an educator and there's complete 100% failure all the time, shouldn't there be a change in regards to that? I've written 15 letters to the NCAA and never received a letter back in regards to my recommendations of what you should be doing there. So I'd appreciate a little consideration in regards to how the mid-majors are created. I think it even made it worse when they had a play down and you had four you had four more teams added in the play down so you're taking a 16 team it's uh, not even a 16 to then qualify as a 16 to get slaughtered by a number 1 so uh, i think that there's a, a, there, sh there should be a change made in regards to that because i don't really think it's fair to those those teams okay would you so would, would you take my recommendation? Because I never get a letter back from your organization. Well, you, well, you've delivered it to the president now, so you don't even have to write anymore. I'll, I'll answer for you, and I'll and I'll make sure. Well, would you take it? I, I, your letter? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Of course. Of course. But I'll, I'll also give you an answer. Okay. Even faster. Even faster than writing back. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so that let me explain how, and this is true of all of our sports, and all of our tournaments. All 89 tournaments get handled in similar fashion. The men's basketball tournaments uh, a little more, and the women's basketball tournament are handled exactly the same. Uh, and they're more structured because there's more attention on them. So the decisions about who gets into tournaments and who doesn't, and where they're seeded, and, and where they're sent in the country for a, tourn for a tournament is all handled the way almost all decisions in the NCAA is, and that's by the member organizations themselves, the universities and colleges, and so in the case of the men's basketball tournament, for example, there's a committee of individuals, mostly athletic directors and former coaches, who are nominated by and selected by the conferences and, and the institutions themselves. They get together. They work unbelievably hard. I was stunned when I took this job a few years ago and saw how hard they work. These guys, they're, they're assigned regions of the country. They're guys and gals. They're assigned the regions of the country. They, they follow conferences and teams all season long. They want, I, can't, I, I love basketball. I can't imagine how they watch this much basketball, but they do. And then by the time they get to, to the, um, the, the selection Sunday, uh, there's a system in place that's actually amazing. And, and the media is, is invited in routinely to go through mock selections. So the couple weeks leading up to the selection Sunday, the media comes in and they literally let the media guys seed the tournament and say, okay, who would you put in here? And they run them through the same process. And it's, it's really interesting because they almost always seed it the same or very similar to the same way uh, given where they are that, at that point in the year. They look at every kind of statistic you can imagine. They have a really uh, thorough computer system that allows direct comparisons from team to team. Uh, they, they then have a complicated voting system. Everybody believes it's sort of something that goes on in the dark of night with the smoky room and scotch. It, it couldn't be further from the truth. There, it, it's as objective a process as I've ever seen. Now, that doesn't answer your question, right? That, that tells you how they go about making those decisions. But the, the basketball community, not the NCAA, the basketball community has said, look, we want to make sure that the best teams get rewarded for their success. And if you're going to make it all the way through the tournament, you have to play a lot of games to get through the tournament. So if you're the best team, and this is true in a number of sports, right, they always get paired up against in, in a bracketing process against the, the, the who's deemed the weaker opponent. 
In, in the basketball tournament, there's 68 teams. There's 32 conferences. So 32 of those teams get in there automatically. They might be ranked, the winner of some conference might be ranked the 150th team in America. But because they won their conference, they get in. And so their reward might be they got to go play a number one seed, but they got into the tournament. And if it had been a straight ranking without those automatic qualifiers, without saying, look, you won your conference, you ought to be rewarded for winning your conference, even though you're not a great team. We're gonna, and, and so a great example, the Ivy League. The Ivy League's been in there forever and ever and ever, but they hadn't won a, Harvard hadn't won a game until last year. They won their first game in NCAA history. But they'd already, they'd been getting into the tournament, but if you looked at where they had been ranked over all those decades, they weren't anywhere near the top 68, but they won the Ivy Leagues. So they were put in. So, yeah, you can change the seating model, and there's a lot of arguments about doing that, and I will pass your note onto the chair of the committee. Okay? How's that? I was going to say, like, my recommendation was, like, for a 1 to play a 10. I mean, if a, if, if a 1 can't beat a 10, then you don't... Yeah, I, I, I understand your point, but here's the other thing. I believe that, I believe that the, the um, men's basketball tournament and the women's basketball tournament, because they operate the same way, the men's basketball tournament is the second most popular athletic event in America behind the Super Bowl. And one of the reasons everybody loves it is because lower-ranked teams have a great opportunity. I mean, Mercer did beat Duke this year, right? Dayton made the Sweet 16. Butler had a shot in the air to beat Duke for the championship. There's no other sport where that happens. Dr. Yes, Ever, you have one more question. You have time. Oh, for I only got one. That was, I should have answered faster. <laughs> yes. Also, I just wanted to uh, mention in regard to the gentleman's comment, exactly what you said. Um, having attended the MAC tournament where number two Manhattan College upended Iona, those young men uh, know they're probably not going to get past the first round, but they're playing for hope. And to take that away from them, I think, would be unfortunate. Um, Cora Brumley, Commissioner of the Little East Conference, which Western Connecticut yes. is a proud member of. Uh, obviously, a lot of the media attention goes to NCAA Division I men's basketball and football. Can you talk a little bit about what Division Three lends to the brand of the NCAA? Yeah, great question. That was like a beautiful softball. That was great. So first of all, um, one of the things that we do, and again, we have media control only over our tournaments. And CBS Turner has our men's basketball tournament contract. ESPN has basically everything else, including the D2 and 3 championships. And in those contracts, we, we have stipulations that they have to air some D2 and D3 games and tournaments, and we like that a lot. Uh, so we're trying to you know, provide more focus and attention to those, to those events. But the reality also is, is that D3, first of all, most people don't know this, there's more member universities, uh, member colleges and in, in universities in D3 than in the other two divisions. And there's um, more student athletes overall in Division Three than in the others. And they provide what I consider to be a model that is exemplary for that integration of academics and athletics. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that, that all of you, there's a bunch of student athletes here. The D3 student athletes have wonderful graduation rates. There's very few of them that are playing for their scholarships. Everybody's playing for their scholarships. Raise your hand. Right? There's no scholarships in Division Three. You're playing because you love playing sports and you get to continue playing a sport that you love as far and as long as you can. Uh, and, and that's at the heart of it what this is all about. So I think D3 serves as that exemplar of what college sports is and should be. And uh, interestingly, when you sit and look at a lot of what D1's doing and D2 has been involved in, is they're also actually trying to emulate a lot of the things that occur here, especially around time and commitment and trying to find ways to get student athletes more time to participate in student life, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of Division III. I can take, can I take one more quick question? Okay. Thank you. It's Thank uh, you. also a D3 uh, question and sure. uh, goes to the very theme you were speaking about. I understand that if a D3 athlete has a medical red shirt, mm -hmm. that medical red shirt year cannot be played in a D3 school. It has to be played in a D1 school. And I'm curious for why that reason would, would exist since uh, the balance that you're speaking about, student athlete, uh, was achieved on that D3 level, why would they have to be kicked up to a D1 school in order to finish their uh, medical redshirt year? 
Yeah, I think the answer would be beats me. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know why that rule was put in place. Again, remember that what I was saying, that the rules are all established by those units. So the rules that govern D3 are put in place by the D3 uh, management council, which is presidents, ADs, commissioners, coaches of D3. And, and so I, I have to tell you that when it comes to that, that particular circumstance, I don't know. I don't know that. Okay, talk to her afterwards. But I, I, I honestly don't know why that rule was put in place. Thank you. Um, it, it, it also predates me, so I, I, can't, I can't answer you. Oh, all right, just one more quick one. I'll be, I'll be really brief. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Justin Mar Robinson, and I'm a current student here. I play basketball here. And my question is, I never could understand how come Division Three don't got a scholarship for students. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody that doesn't understand that, raise your hand. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Um, because so so I will answer on behalf of Division Three univers, uh, universities and colleges uh, because that's the way they decided years ago, decades ago, to conduct college sports. The Ivy Leagues do the same thing, by the way. They're Division One, but they don't provide any scholarships. So they just decided collectively, we don't want to get in the business of providing scholarships. And while today it seems a little odd, but believe it or not, the first, the, the, when scholarships were first offered to any student athlete, I forget when it was, how long ago it was, uh, in the 40s, I think it was, or 50s, uh, people went crazy and they said, no, 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 that's compensation. We can't pay players. I mean, that's inappropriate. We can't be providing financial aid to a student athlete. That doesn't make any sense. And there was actually a rule called the sanity rule that the presidents all passed. And they, they said, no, we're never going to do this for college sports. And then they wound up doing it slowly uh, in division, in what became division, division one. But it's always been a philosophical position of the division three schools that that's just not something that we want to do. And, and so it's their choice. Um, they have expressed, Jim, I've never heard anybody express any interest in changing that. Uh, and, and so the nice thing about NCAA sports is you've got three relative divisions, right, of one and two and three, and uh, student athletes can try to pursue a scholarship at one of the other schools if they want them, or they can decide to come to a D3 school and, and go to a school that they want and play but without a scholarship. So it's, it's strictly a matter of philosophical choice of the colleges and universities in the division. Okay? You bet. Okay. I think we're done. Thank you. Bob Grammer, thank you so much. I, as, as our speaker says, if you watch ESPN, you get one view of intercollegiate athletics, but I think we heard a more complex, nuanced, uh, broader view uh, this evening, and I hope it was useful to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you again, Dr. Sure, Nick, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.